I'm really glad that you've joined us today because my friend Henry and I are going to be history detectives and today we're looking at the Great Fire of London. Now the Great Fire of London burnt for four days in September 1666. It burnt a large area of the City of London, almost 160 hectares, which is the same as 160 rugby pitches that you might see on your school fields. It was the worst fire ever to affect the city. It was, could be seen over 60 kilometres away, which means that if you set off walking in the morning and walked all day, 10 hours later, you would still have been able to see the fire burning. Most of London's main burn, buildings burnt down, uh, and that was St Paul's Cathedral, together with about 97 churches and 13,000 people's homes. Thousands of Londoners were left without anything at all. They lost everything and the Great Fire ruined most of Britain's biggest capital and turned it into a smoking ruin. London's burning, London's burning, fetch the engines, fetch the engines, fire, 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 pour on water, pour on water. <laughs> Hello Henry. Hello. Did you know that that song relates to the Great Fire of London? Really? Yes. Children had been singing songs like it earlier, but after the Great Fire of London, the words were changed so that they could talk about that particular fire that happened in 1666. Was that a long time ago? It was a very, very long time ago. So long ago, I'm going to need a number line to help me work out how long it was. You probably use these in maths, and we're using quite big numbers, but it will really help us to work it out. So if we take from the 66, we can add on 4, which will get us to 1670. And then we can add on another 30 to get us to 1700. After that, it's a bit easier because we can count in 100 years to get us all the way up there. Do you know what 100 years is called, Henry? Uh, centipede. <laughs> That's very close, but it's called a century. Oh. A hundred years is called a century. So, in order to keep going, we can go from 1700 to 1800. That will be another hundred years. To 1900. Another hundred years. Or, what did we call it, Henry? A century. Well done you, you remembered it. Up to the year 2000. And then, what year are we in now, Henry? 2021. We are 2021, so I'm going to add on the last 21 for there. Right, oops, where's it gone? Now I just need to add up all of my numbers. I've got... Let's go with the units first. I've got a four and a one, which makes five. I've got a three and a two, which makes a five for the tens. And then for the hundreds, there's 100, 200, 300. There we go, 355 years ago, Henry. Wow. But if it was so long ago, then how do we know what happened? Well, that's where being history detectives come in. We're going to look at what evidence we can find to tell us the answers. Now, luckily, people like Samuel Pepys kept a diary of the Great Fire of London. He was actually in London at the time and he wrote down everything that he saw. And we can still read it today, which helps us to know what was going on. We call that primary evidence because it was written down at the time of the, uh, the history by somebody who was there. We can actually listen to what he said, shall we? Yeah. Sunday, the 2nd of September, 1666, Lord's Day. 
Jane, our maid, called us at about three in the morning to tell us of the great fire in the city. So I rose and slipped on my nightgown and went to her window. I thought it would be far enough off. And so I went to bed again and to sleep. The next morning, Jane comes in and tells me that she hears above 300 houses have been burned down tonight by the fire we saw, and that it is now burning all of Fish Street by London Bridge. So I walked to the Tower of London and got up onto one of the high places. And there I did see the houses at the end of the bridge all on fire, and a great infinite fire at this. So down, with my heart full of trouble, I spoke to the lieutenant of the tower, who tells me that it has begun this morning in King's Baker House on Pudding Lane, and it hath burnt St. Magnus's church in most part of Fish Street already. I returned home, and we had an extraordinarily good dinner, and were as merry at the time as we could be. Only now and then walking into the garden, I saw how horridly the sky looked, all on a fire in the night. It was enough to put us out of our wits, and indeed, it was extremely dreadful, for it looks as just if we and the whole heavens are on fire. Pudding Lane? Fish Street? <laughs> those are some funny names. <laughs> yes, they are really, aren't they? But in those days, people who did the same job tended to live and work in the same street. So all the bakers would have lived in Pudding Lane because they made puddings. Mm -hmm. That might have been called Dread Street in a different town. Who do you think lived in Fish Street then? Uh, mermaids. <laughs> no, they lived in the sea. Uh, oh, right. Um, fish sellers. That's right. So we know from Pepys' diary that he watched the fire from the Tower of London. The fire started in a bakery, Thomas Farriner, who was the king's baker. He hadn't put his fire out correctly, and so the fire soon lit his whole bakery up. Now Thomas and his family managed to escape. They went out the top window, over the roofs, to the next door neighbour. But soon the whole bakery was alight, and then it set fire to a stable next door, because they were full of hay, because there were lots of animals in London at that time. Before we knew it, the whole of the street had set on fire and it had spread along to the waterfront because it was right by the River Thames and all of those warehouses were filled with oil and lots of other things that would blow up and create a massive fire. And that way, the fire spread all along the Thames waterfront. What happened to all the people who lived in the houses? Well, Peeps tells us about that too. Shall we listen? Yeah. On Sunday, I went down to the waterside and there got into a boat, was taken through London Bridge, and there saw a lamentable fire. Everybody was endeavouring to remove their goods and was flinging them into the river or bringing them into the boats. Poor people were staying in their houses as long as they could until the very fire touched them and then they ran to the boats. And among other things, the poor pigeons did not want to leave their houses, but hovered about the windows and balconies until they burned their wings and fell down. This evening the news comes that the fire is growing, so we were forced to begin to pack our own things and prepare them for removal. I got my bags of gold in my office and was ready to carry it away, so great was our fear. About two in the morning my wife calls me up and tells me of new cries of fire at the bottom of our lane. I, finding it so resolved to take my gold away, and, oh, and her of course, what a sad sight by moonlight to see, the whole city almost on fire. About four o'clock in the morning, I carried away all my money and the best things to Woolwich. I rode myself in a nightgown in the cart and lord, to see how the streets and the highways are crowded with people running and riding and fetching away things. I am eased at my heart to have my treasure so well secured. I did a dig in a hole in our garden and put our wine in it, and my parmesan cheese, as well as my papers and some other things that we simply cannot transport. <laughs> parmesan cheese. <laughs> yes, so we can see there was a difference between whether you were rich or poor at the time of the Great Fire of London. The poor had few belongings. They wanted to stay in their house as long as they could, hoping that it wouldn't burn. Uh, but when they knew it was going to, they had to take their belongings and desperately throw them into the river to try and save them a little bit. And the, yeah, and the poor pigeons lost their houses too. Yes. You see, there was a difference between whether you were poor or had the advantages that the rich had. 
You see, they were able to take their masses of gold and valuables and put them in carts and send them out to the country where they stayed with friends instead. And that's what Pepys did. There's always going to be a difference, you see. Not, you can't say that everybody has the same experience and say that the people did something. There's always going to be a difference, particularly between rich and poor. But how did they fight the fire? Did they really <clears throat> fetch the engines, fetch the engines, fire, 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 pour on water, pour on water? Well, they did have engines, but not the big red fire engines that you're thinking of. Oh. They had carts on which they put their firefighting equipment, and these they called their engines. Now, we have some other primary evidence, because these are um, firefighting equipment that's in the Museum of London, and they were used during the Great Fire of London. Now, the houses were great big wooden things that could easily be pulled down. So this top one is a big, long hook that would reach all the way to the top of the house and the people would pull it down so that they stopped the fire from spreading to that house. They hoped that that would put the fire out, you see. They also have leather buckets, which they filled with water from the River Thames and used that to pour on water. And then they had this item. Now this is like a great big giant syringe. You know when you go to the doctor sometimes and they jab you in the arm to give you a vaccination to uh, keep you safe? Yeah, and afterwards it's always ow, 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 owie. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, this is a syringe like that, but this one's huge. And they filled it with water and then they shot that at the fire to go again, try and put it out. Peeps explains all about these methods. Let's listen to what he's got to say again. Having seen the fire rage every way and nobody endeavouring to put it out, only to remove their own goods and belongings, I went to the king to tell him of what I saw, and unless his majesty did command houses to be pulled down, nothing could stop the fire. He seemed much troubled and commanded me to go to the Lord Mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth, and command him to pull down the houses before the fire could reach them in every way. At last met my Lord Mayor. To the king's message he cried like a fainting woman, Lord, what can I do? I am tired. People will not obey me. I have been pulling down houses, but the fire overtakes us faster than we can do it. And he went to his home and thence left town. The king and his brother, the Duke of York, have now taken command, and so on Tuesday have begun the practice of blowing up houses. Which at first did frighten people more than anything, but it stopped the fire where it was done, as it brought down the houses to the ground in the same place as they stood, and then it was easy to quench what little fire was in it. I find by blowing up houses is a good sign of stopping the fire. The fire spread so quickly because the houses were made of wood. They were very close together, as well as you can see in this picture, which was drawn about the same time as the Great Fire of London. So it's another source of primary evidence. You can see from the picture that the houses are all rickety. They're wider at the top than they are at the bottom and they lean in towards each other quite alarmingly. There are even sometimes poles put between the houses to prop them up. So you can see how easily the fire would have split from one house to the other. Now the fire was going far too fast for the hooks that we already looked at. They couldn't pull down the houses before the fire had jumped over to the house opposite. And that's why they needed to blow them up using gunpowder. Even the king went along and helped with that. Well, I would have liked to hear them go, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> but what happened next? Well, the gunpowder worked, and after four days, the fire was very nearly out. Peeps went out for a walk and tells us what he saw. Thursday, the 6th of September, 1666. Up about five o'clock. At Bishop's Gate, where no fire had yet been near, there is now one broken out, which did make me think that there is some kind of plot in this. There is talk of the French that are having a hand in setting fires. <laughs> we walked out into Moorfield. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Our feet get ready to burn. Hot, 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 hot. And walking through the town amongst the hot coals. Ow, ow, owie. And find the fields full of people and more poor wretches carrying their goods out there. And a great blessing it is to them that it is good weather for them to keep outside night and day. 
I picked up a piece of glass in the street so melted and bent with the heat of the fire it was like parchment paper. I could not find any place to buy a shirt or a pair of gloves. I also did see a poor cat being taken out of a hole in the chimney with hair all burned off the body and yet alive. Friday the 7th of September 1666. Up by five o'clock and blessed be God find all well. The fire was out. I saw that the town burned in a miserable sight of St. Paul's Church, with all the roofs and walls fallen. People do all in the world cry out for the foolishness of the Lord Mayor in this business of the fire, blaming it all upon him. But it is a strange thing to see how long this time did seem since Sunday, having been a fall of actions and little sleep, that it looked like a week or more, and I had forgot that almost to the day of the week I did sleep pretty well but hath sleeping and waking at a fear of fire in my heart. Many people, including Pepys, thought the fire had been started deliberately. By the French. Oh. Well, that's because fires that weren't near the main blaze had started catching fire. But really, it was sparks from the main fire that had just been blown there by the wind. Oh. It was all a huge accident. Now, London took a long time to rebuild. St Paul's Cathedral took over 40 years to rebuild and 100,000 people were left homeless by it and had to leave London for good. Uh, did you get on call with the actual Samuel Pepys then? <laughs> no, that was an actor called Jake. Hello. The real Samuel Pepys looked like this. But Jake was reading the diary that Samuel Pepys wrote during the fire of London, so it's a primary source. We had lots of primary evidence today, didn't we? We had Pepys's diary, we had the picture of the houses, and we had the objects that are in the Museum of London that were helped to fight the fire at the Great Fire of London. So, what did we learn today then, history detectives? Um, that the Great Fire of London started on the 4th of September in 1666 and raged for four days. King Charles II was the king and he saved London by ordering houses to be pulled down before the fires could spread to them. 13,000 houses were burned, which meant that many poor people sadly had to leave London and move somewhere else. Well done, Henry. Well remembered. Yeah. Would you like to see the picture of the Great Fire of London that I've done? Oh, yes, please. So this was a really fun craft to do. Wow. Can you see? You do that yourself? I did. Yeah, and it's really very easy. Would you like me to show you? Then maybe you could do it at home sometime. Yeah. So, I started off <laughs> with colouring in some white, white paper and I've got my crayons here which were um, red and orange and yellow and all sorts of fiery colours. Wow, those are some pretty colours. What it's important to do is to make sure that you don't leave any gaps of white in it. Next, I got some black paint and I mixed some washing up liquid with it as well. Hmm and I painted over the entire piece of paper. Okay, so there were none, none of this was um, shown left. So you painted the whole piece of paper in colours and then covered the whole thing in black paint. I did, that's right. And then here comes a really fun bit at the end. You get something that's scratchy, like a pen will do it, and you just scratch off the top layer of black paint, showing the fiery colours underneath. Would you like to have a go? Oh yeah. That's right, yeah, you've done a great job there. Oh, it's a bit hard to hold it with those paws, isn't it? Shall I help you a little bit? There we go. Ugh. Comes off easy. Comes easier when you've got hands, doesn't it, Henry? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> so you can see that I'm revealing the fiery colours underneath the black. And that works really well for showing like the sparks of the fire. And then I've put much more at the top top here to show that that house is on fire. I get it. So you scratch away the black paint and all the color that you put underneath it shows up like, like an actual fire. That's right, magic. Then on top of it, I've cut out some more black paper and I've put on housing shapes. Can you see them there over the top? Oh yeah, I see they're, they're wide at the top and then they are at the bottom and they've got the beams connecting them. That's right, well remembered again, Henry, that was super. Yeah, 
So I've made these look like the houses and then I've made the fire come out of them. Yeah, and I think it looks really very effective and it was a lot of fun to do. You could make one of these at home or if you like, you could use some junk modelling to make a Tudor house uh, or even out of Lego. Oh, I love Legos. They're my favourite. <laughs> if you prefer writing, you could write a poem or even a story about the Great Fire of London. Maybe pretend that you were in it. Ooh. <laughs> there are lots of resources on the internet as well, so if you want to do any more research or find other things to do, then there are some really good ones around. The Museum of London has got a lot of information on it. And look at, look at their website here. <gasps> they built the entire Great Fire of London in Minecraft. They have, that's right. That's really worth a look. And also the BBC, lots of other really good resources on things like that. Okay, so enjoy yourself. Go and find out more, history detectives. High five, history detectives. See you again soon, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.